My name is Lorna Schumann. I am the museum educator for schools at the Illinois State Museum. And I am very excited today to be here with all of our teachers and our students. I want to welcome you and just please feel free to ask questions. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. And the way I would like to start from the, from the Illinois State Museum here in Springfield is I want to do a land acknowledgement. And I realize for many of our students, this may be something that's very new. So what I'm going to do is read what my land acknowledgement is and share with you a little bit about what land acknowledgement is and what happens. It's something that really is happening in a lot of places in Canada and in New Zealand and Australia and is starting to take place here in the United States. So I want to honor the land upon which we are all standing today and the people who are here first in this land. We call that a land acknowledgement. And basically acknowledgement is to say, I see you and I know that you are here and I know what happened. I understand how the first people of these lands were forced away from their home through multiple treaties or agreements and were forcibly removed from their homes. Out of respect for the people whose land that I am standing on today, I want to acknowledge or say I see you to the people whose ancient homeland this is, which were the Peoria and the Kickapoo people. And also acknowledge that I am standing on the lands that the Potawatomi and many other people used as an area for trading and hunting. Springfield is a place on the trail of death on which the Potawatomi and other native people walked when they were forcibly removed from Illinois and the Great Lakes region. All of these First Nation people had and still have a strong relationship or connection with the land and with each other. And they consider these lands and homes and are very connected to them today. I invite each of you to learn and explore the first people who lived on the land where you are located today. And this program is one of the ways that the museum is taking action to support indigenous or native people of Illinois. So I thank you for letting me share my land acknowledgement with you. And I know you're all excited as I am to welcome Miss Nora Moore Lloyd. Miss Lloyd is an Ojibwe artist who has art related to her Ojibwe culture exhibiting right now in the Illinois State Museum in Springfield. She's one of the six artists that we're feature, featuring in the Human Nature exhibit. And so with that, I would like to go ahead and turn this over to Nora and let her get started. So Nora, please. Thank you so much. And Buju, uh, Buju and Anin. Buju is uh, an Ojibwe way of greeting. And, and uh, it means it's similar to hello or how are you. A name in Ojibwe is different. It's a greeting that Ojibwe people give to each other, but it means literally it translates, I see your light. So what a nice way to greet someone. Different, as you'll see, Ojibwe is very different from English. But what I would like to do also is thank the museum for inviting me to share my story. The, um, it, let me get down. There's my, that's how you spell Buju and Anin. It's a particularly good time to share stories with many native cultures. Winter is the time of telling. And when you think, I mean, winter, of course, days are shorter and uh, weather is colder. So what we do 
<clears throat> is stay inside and gather with our family and friends. But in, in Native culture, it was an important way to pass on the tribal history. So, because for a long time, as you know, history, Native history was not written down. So, uh, people would gather in the winter and the elders would pass on stories about their tribe's history and also about ceremonies. An important thing, the younger generations knew that when they would come together, they would listen. It was important, the information being shared, the stories were important. So, so we will talk stories today. Uh, my story is an odd one because really my story is a combination of my grandmother, Anna, and her history, which has now become mine. Uh, she had a difficult beginning to her life. She was born on the Coudere Reservation in Wisconsin, which is in the beautiful Northwoods, 400 miles north. Uh, she was, her father was George Barber, her mother, Gweki Gabuikwe, and Anna was orphaned young. Her father died when she was one, her mother when she was two. So she was being raised by her grandparents and her father, grandfather, Chief Blue Sky, his wife and many, many cousins were raising her. Uh, Back at, and this, she was born in 1880. That's a long time ago. And as you know, times were very different and difficult on the reservations. Uh, in those days, native kids were, were made to go to either government schools or mission schools. In Anna's case, there was, or on our reservation, there were two mission schools. One was the Presbyterian mission, where Anna would go, was made to go. Uh, when she was approximately seven, the sc that school, that little school was closing. And the two women who ran it kidnapped, essentially, my grandmother. They took her from, from gorgeous forests and lakes of Wisconsin to Warsaw, Indiana, where they raised her. So that was her peculiar beginning. I created this photo collage of showing my grandmother on the left, young, teenage. And, and here, if you can see in the center, what was important to me in this collage was to show Anna holding me, when, because that really was the beginning of of our shared story. So Anna here, and then that's me at 10 months old or something. And then down here is the Anna I remember looking like most grandparents. The other side here is my 90 year old log cabin up on the reservation. And and me little and and just how things how my story evolved uh, and I will talk more 
about uh, this photo in a moment. So, so the reconnecting, uh, my story is essentially a tale of, of after a hundred years from, from my family being gone from the reservation, I showed up and, and closed the circle. I still have cousins on the reservation. On my first trip up there, uh, our then tribal chairman is my cousin. And uh, Chief Blue Sky, my great great grandfather, was his great great uncle. To give you some perspective, here is Anna again, her, my grandfather, Arthur, and just, I need to throw this in, that's me, only because I had had an accident, so my hair had all been cut off. I mean, you, you would think that's a boy, but that's me. Anna again, uh, as a young woman, but think, how different, I mean, this is after she was living with the missionaries. Had she still been on the reservation, she would not look, she would have long hair, I'm sure, braids and, and her Ojibwe clothes. I and mean, not, she would not look like that. What started, uh, this whole search, my mother, who was not native, had been tracing her genealogy. And when Anna was alive, mother said, you know, hey, I think I'll, I'll trace your family. And what was your maiden name? Anna replied, Blue. She said her maiden name was Anna Blue which of course came from Ujawishkuki Jig, Blue Sky. So, uh, so mother then, and this way before ancestry.com, but uh, mother wrote to the town of Hayward, which butts up to the reservation for birth records. They didn't have me, the county didn't have me. The state didn't have me. One of those three said, said, why don't you try Le Coudre? I mean, the governor, there should be birth records on everyone. If you're not finding it, try Le Coudre. And of course, everything was there. The, my entire family tree had been researched by a woman on the reservation only because it was so strange to have the chief's granddaughter disappear. I mean, Anna went to school one day and never came back. I mean, she, they took her to Indiana. She met and married a wonderful non-native man and, and she died not telling her children she was Indian, which is uh, why half my life, I, I didn't know I had relatives up north. This speaks to um, the missionaries evidently thought they, they were doing something good in taking this child from her home and big family to a different state, hundreds of miles away, and, and made, raised her trying to be non-native. So, so Anna, I believe, was made to feel ashamed of that, which is why she, she didn't even tell her children. So it's, it's a 
complicated issue. Uh, this shows the names of, of my blue sky family and what many, if not most, native tribes teach children young that uh, what they do in life will affect gener people seven generations away. They're taught that they have a responsibility. We all have a responsibility to, to know that what I do today can affect seven generations later. And, and actually I now know, I mean, look at that, that's seven generations, beginning with me down here, my father, Anna, her mother, Gwaiki Gabuikwe, then Chief Blue Sky, Ojewishkugijig, and his father, wait a Wei Wei Sins, and then, and I'm not sure on the pronunciation of the next one. So with that knowledge, uh, oh, and I thought I'd share with you, this is my three greats, great, great, great grandfather. And here, is Chief Blue Sky, who, who was raising him, his wife and other kids were raising Anna until uh, she was taken. And he, was, he joined a group of other Ojibwe chiefs when they went to Washington in 1880, which I'm assuming was, was part of protesting against the upcoming 1887 Dawes Act, the Allotment Act. Now, Anna is living in Warsaw, Indiana. Her, her blue sky family wondering what happened, her uncle, uh, found her, and, and as is the case with us, we know with our family, we want to hear what's going on with cousin, with our extended family. I mean, that's why we have Facebook now or Instagram. We have all different ways to stay in touch. In the late 1800s, Frank Blue Sky, first of all, didn't speak English. He spoke Ojibwe, but they missed Anna. They, they weren't, her family wasn't sure what had happened. So he, Frank Blue Sky had to travel to Hayward about 10 miles away, I assume by horse. Uh, he had to speak the word, what he wanted to say to a translator who then wrote down the words and then Frank Blue Sky copied them. I mean, that's an enormous effort to stay in touch with his niece. And it's all the letters, as you'll hear, are saying, hey, don't forget us up here. And this is what's happening at home. I need to tell you some of the news, remembering those were hard days on reservation. Some of the news is sad, but what I'd like to do, uh, several years ago, I had a professor on the reservation translate these letters back from English into Ojibwe. So, so I'll play those so that you can get a sense of what I'll go through these quickly and look at the handwriting. I mean, now in the days of text, you don't see beautiful script like that. 
And again, remembering the effort it took for him to copy the English, and this from 1892. And let me read this one because it's hard to read. Nora, we do have one question. The, question, right. the question is, um, since Frank Blue Sky didn't um, speak English, so the handwriting we see is not his? Is that no. Right? No, it is his. That's why these are extraordinarily special. He, that's his handwriting. The, as I understand it, he, he said the words, and then the man in Hayward wrote it down, and then Frank, wanting it to be his words, but in English, Frank copied. No, that's, that's his handwriting, which is pretty wonderful to see an ancestor's handwrite his thoughts then. But this letter from 1894, uh, Annie, I will write to you again to tell you how we're getting along. My brother, Louis, he is very sick. I could not to do anything on the farm. I went fishing this morning. I catch 33 nice bass and I went on the chief dam. This afternoon, I saw a large crew of men driving logs on the river. I just came in 20 minutes ago. This just five o'clock. Goodbye, your uncle, Frank Blue Sky. And I wanted to read that because not a whole lot else was going on on the reservation then. I mean, it, it was a pretty simple life. And yet he wanted her to know that he caught 33 bass and where he was and what time it was and that he was thinking of her. Now, this of the six, this letter I find to be the most meaningful. And this is written uh, just two months later. And let me read it to you. My dear niece, I take the pen and ink to write to you with sad news. Poor Lewis, my younger brother, he is dead. Half past seven yesterday evening. Most my tears burst every minute and I could not write very well, my eyes so leap. And he saved before he died, I got pure white wings, I think. God bless me. From your uncle, Frank Blue Sky. What, and that clearly in English is, uh, is different. I mean, the word, his word choice. Most my tears burst every minute, and I could not write very well. My eyes so leak is beautiful, I think. What I would like to do, if it works here, is to play it for you in Ojibwe. Letter three. Go over so your county with schools. It's also going to be the day of the Jesus, 1894. Nishimis, I was a big enough, I was a big enough, and I was a tuna, the manajimo tuna. Nimishish, Louis Yeshqua Yashig in his was of the Boyaganic, Pijinago, Yonago Shig. Nabashka day made us of the Boyagans, famous saying. Nimbana would tune the men of be a gayan, when the zinging way sayan. Mishka kiddo the Buana boy. Nawabish kinigui gonna budge. Nijawe na make money do. 
It's just shame, Frank Blue Sky. What I would like to point out to you, going back to Frank Blue Sky writing these, if you hear the content and look at that letter, which is a, a copy of his letter, those three splat, those are his tear drops. I mean, he was crying when he wrote them because in, in, the, in 1894, he was using a fountain pen. So, so the tears splot made splotches on his ink there. Letter four. No end of my end of Ginway's keep him marjib be a mawis a wombun. Minua does she go gay bizarre. Nipple bomb is a man evening. Is you say, Frank A. Blue Sky? To read letter four, he said, Dear sir, my dear niece. I am very obliged to you for your pictures, which are I received them this week. And I'm getting very sorry for you did not write to me for a long since. And I'm doing quite business this summer from Frank, Uncle Frank Blue Sky. So what I take from that is, is they are still missing her. She left a hole in, the, in her community. And one other letter I would like to read. Just to, let me see here. While this is going on, just so you get a comparison, somehow an attorney in the town of Hayward became Anne's, uh, Anna's guardian. So in 1892, Anna with the missionaries uh, wanted to take piano lessons and evidently felt she had to ask permission so the attorney sent her this letter back and just listened to the different teachers, listen to this grammar. Dear little Annie, your letter of March 25th last is received. I was very much pleased to hear from you and judging from your letter, which was very nicely written indeed, I should say that you are improving your time at school. It is fortunate for you that your home and surroundings are so pleasant and you must give heed to the good advice given you by Mr. Doherty's family. I know you will. If you wish to take music lessons, you may do so. I presume, of course, you have consulted Miss Doherty, that's the missionary, about this matter. It will perhaps become necessary for you to work a little harder when you take up music so that you won't get behind in your schoolwork. A little more here. You did not tell me in your letter the kind of instrument you desired to learn to play upon. Who will give you the music lessons? I would prefer Miss Doherty to anyone else if she will give you the instruction. Finally, write me another letter soon. 
I wish you success in your study of music. You must work hard and strive to become a good musician and good scholar. So we all will be proud of you. Your guardian. Quite a difference in tone, don't you think, from, from this affectionate, loving, her uncle sent her to you better study hard. So this was the atmosphere that Anna was living in. Uh, just a few, oh, here she is, just to show you that and these are kind of normal high school things. There's Anna. And Anna. And Anna. And just briefly, meanwhile, of course, my grandfather was around. Uh, he was born in 1881. Here he is. I wanted to show you these, not because family photos or, or vacation photos can be less interesting for non-related people, but to show you what, what people in the late 1800s, how, how they posed for their important family portraits. I mean, now we all have selfies. Here, they put on their best clothes and probably for a long exposure had to sit for two minutes or so. But I point it out also, and this is the late 1800s. I'm not so ancient, but I knew three people in there. And this is my grandfather. And his, I knew my great aunts and this one lived to be 101. So my point is all of this story isn't so long ago. Moving on. And then fine. the next generation, I mean, it's my father here. He was born in 1906. So this is probably 1908. What a change. Then in 1983, when I discovered uh, the Coudre and my ancestors, Pipe Mustache, who was the tribe's oldest elder and our spiritual leader, before I met him on the first trip. And, and he said, well, what, what do you know about us? And I said, well, Nothing, and he said, you're right. And I will teach you, I mean, you need the impact. He said, why don't you spend six months up here? I will teach you about it. And of course I was working at the time and, and couldn't, but uh, we spoke every month. He decided two years later, it was time for me to, to have a name in Ojibwe name, because uh, in our culture, when, when you pass on, the creator will know you by your spirit, your Ojibwe name. We had a, I don't want to run out of time here, my, my name, the name that Pipe awarded me is Gog, G-A-A-G, -A -A which means porcupine. Uh, I didn't, I had never been to a naming. I didn't know the protocol. When, when you read story fiction, uh, I don't think I had ever seen reading about native Thing, written by non-native people. I never saw Gog used as a name, so it, it caught me by surprise. Joe Homesky, another elder on the reservation, 
who sponsored me said, because I think I may have bristled when, when Pike said Gog at the naming ceremony. So Joe stepped out and he, he said, well, let me explain where this comes from. <clears throat> Pipe had taken the tobacco I offered him and smoked it. And then in his vision, he explained, he saw, he usually in the naming, the, the name comes to him in this, in my instance, uh, he said he saw in his vision, he saw a person coming toward him that then turned into a big swirl and ended up being this enormous porcupine. So he knew that would have to be my name. Joe Holmesky explained, it said that many generations ago, our tribe was suffering. They, they were not having luck hunting or fishing, they were starving. And it was said that the porcupine sacrificed itself to nourish, to save the community. So, so the porcupine is, is an honored uh, animal to the tribe. And interestingly, um, when you add I-K-W-E to the end of a noun, that makes it feminine. Like my great grandmother, Gweki Gabu Ikwe. So, so Pai could have named me Gog Ikwe, but he didn't. It's just Gog. And he never called me Nora again. I mean, I think he, he probably forgot that part because that was unimportant. I mean, it was quite a moment. Then uh, after I, I discovered that uh, there is a vibrant, active, big Indian community in Chicago that growing up in the suburbs, I, I never knew existed, which is why it's so important now, I think, <clears throat> to, to start teaching this native information young. And that's why I present at, at schools. There was a college in Chicago, Native American Educational Services, where I finished my bachelor's degree. My, and it was really master level work. My, uh, what I did for my thesis was photograph and record elders in our native community who founded the community and, and all the native organizations, which is, uh, I mean, they, they define how, how our community uh, existed because they all came, the early people who founded uh, the American Indian Center and the community came right from reservation and a few of the elders I interviewed barely spoke English. So what a, a courageous move. And there are several different tribes um, that are represented in Lakota. And to that point, there's an article in the Chicago Tribune that they had interviewed Angie, who became, all of these elders became dear friends of mine. But here, uh, Angie says it best about uh, how, on, how Chicago was. She said, we're all American Indians and there is a good feeling when I'm among my people. That's important because the Chicago's American Indian Center and community is multi-tribal. 
that we have Navajo, we have Lakota, we have Choctaw, and, and we have tribes from the East and the mostly Midwest, Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, Ojibwe, but, and, and Oneida and Ho-Chunk, and she was Ho-Chunk. But her feeling, I mean, that sums it up, that uh, we're, all, we're all one, we're all native. And what uh, I discovered, I, I switched from elders to, to focusing on nature in my photography. And, and I wanted to learn about different tribes. So this is a petroglyph from uh, New Mexico. And, and hawks have become pretty important to me. Uh, the Ojibwe believe that hawks are messengers from, from people who have passed on. So I had this for 15 years, I've had a family of Cooper's hawks. So now many generations that come to my backyard frequently. Uh, so I thought I'd show you some of those. This you will see in, um, this is a photo, the color photo is from my, from the Couture showing how birch bark is harvested every spring. And the other side of this banner, which you'll see in the museum, is a photo from 1909 taken in a neighborhood uh, five minutes away from me. But look at the birch trees. Again, it's in 1909, you are seeing signs of where the native people who lived here before all the current residents, where they harvested birch bark. I had uh, these photos in a show in a small gallery here because I know people living there now never think who was here before. Uh, so I, I wanted to point that out. Nora, and, yes. We have a couple of questions. Um, Great. One is, does taking the birch bark off the tree hurt the tree? So that's one question. And then the other one is kind of related to it is they're curious what kind of tools um, your people used and how they were made. The birch bark, uh, when they harvest birch bark, it doesn't hurt the trees. They know exactly how deep to go, and which isn't very deep, and, and when to do it in the spring. I think when it's after the sap has started running, I would guess, and then they carefully peel it off. Uh, and, and that was, birch bark was used for canoes. I mean, birch bark was an important um, element of life for canoes, which for the Ojibwe was their main mode of transportation. And also for wigwams, where they would stretch the bark over saplings. They, I have seen on the reservation really, really tall old trees that way at the top show the marks of harvesting. So, so that had to have happened 80 years ago. So it, uh, no, they, they know, I guess they learned through experimentation hundreds of years ago how deep to do it and how far to space it. And, and now they use just very sharp knives. Good question. And the other question was, what kind of tools do your people use and how were they made? Uh, see, I, I don't know how 
they were made originally. They, obviously, they were metal. And now they are just very sharp metal, um, almost like a, a big exacto knife would be my my guess. That that video in the museum exhibition shows the harvesting. That maybe we could share at some point with uh, classes. And and all I'm showing here is, along with photography, I thought I would fiddle on um, painting, uh, only because I have been told over and over again that with practice I will improve. We'll see about that. I, I am not embarrassed to show you early attempts at painting. And of course, they're, they're birds, naturally. Finally, miigwech, which is thank you in Ojibwe. And also, just like the word for hello is different, there isn't a word in Ojibwe for goodbye. Igawabaman means I'll see you again. It isn't goodbye, or it's I'll see you again. Igawabaman. So thank you. I'm aware. Um, I'll check and see if there are any other questions. But I think one of the questions about the tool, what other types of tools did people use in their normal every day life? Mostly bone. They, for example, when, uh, when they harvested a deer, then they, uh, because many of their clothes were made from deer hide, that the shin bone of the deer was used to scrape uh, to get the, the fur off. So bones were, were sharpened. I know thin bones were used for sewing. Uh, stone, of course. And, and that's all I can think of. Okay. Well, the Gitch Witch, thank you so much for all of your time, Nora. Um, and I want to thank you all for joining us today. Nora, thank you so much. Oh, great. Well, and Gigawapaman. Really, it's, it's a pleasure. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we hope you appreciated um, your time spent with us. We definitely appreciated the time. And we will see you again. Thank you so much.